Well, it's lovely to see so many of you here with us to celebrate this morning as we celebrate the conception by St. Anna of the Mother of God. Human life, as we all know as Catholics, it begins at conception, at the very beginning of a human life within the womb. And there are many places in Scripture where God speaks about his relationship with life in the womb. So I wanted to read a couple of these as a prelude to our feast today. In one of the Psalms, in Psalm 138, King David, the psalmist, says, For it was you, Lord, who created my being, knit me together in my mother's womb, I thank you for the wonder of my being, for the wonders of all your creation. Already you knew my soul. And the verb there implies more than a mental knowing. It implies total relationship. It even implies marital relationship. That's how thoroughly the Lord knows our life, even within our mother's womb. Already you knew my soul, and my body held no secret from you when I was being fashioned in secret. Your eyes saw all of my actions before every one of my days was decreed. Um, Sorry, your eyes saw all my actions. Every one of my days was decreed before any one of them came into being. And to the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And then in New Testament times, we all remember the story of the visitation, where when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant John the Baptist leapt within her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So my point is that Um, If, as we all know, the natural life of a human being begins at conception, how much more does the supernatural life, the spiritual life of a human also begin at conception? And so today, rightly, we celebrate the conception of our Blessed Mother in the womb of St. Anne. The readings give reference to barrenness, because tradition has it that St. Anna was barren for 50 years until, as a result of deep prayer, she was finally able to conceive our Blessed Mother. So we have heard of God's action in blessing and sanctifying Jeremiah and John the Baptist within the womb. But Catholic teaching, of course, is that the Theotokos was sanctified from the first moment of her conception, which in the Latin terminology is what we know as Immaculate Conception. That's not a reference to Christ, that's a reference to the Blessed Mother, that from the first moment of her existence, because of the goodness of Jesus Christ and his holiness, she was preserved from all stain of sin from the very first moment of her existence. Now this teaching has become... Um, at least controversial in the Christian East, with many of the Orthodox churches saying they don't agree with his teaching. It was only formalised, solemnly defined for us as Catholics in 1854. But it's been, this feast has been part of our tradition uh, since at least the seventh century. We have celebrated this conception, so one could almost say, what are we celebrating? if we're not celebrating this conception as a holy and immaculate event. And um, this feast is referenced in many writings of the ancient Christian East, one of which says that as the first man was formed from immaculate earth, that is, from the earth before it was cursed by God, it was therefore necessary that the perfect man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, should be born from an immaculate virgin. And um, I think this is St. Ephraim. Yes, St. Ephraim the Syrian says, You indeed and your mother are the only ones who are beautiful in every way. For in you, Lord, there is no spot. And in your mother, there is no stain. 
for she was entirely free from every defilement. You know, the teaching of the purity um, of the conception of the Theotokos was only something that the Orthodox began to disagree with us about fairly recently. And as late as the, uh, the 14th century, we hear a metropolitan of Thessalonica saying, the all-pure virgin, as is right, alone can refuse to apply to herself the words of the prophet David. She alone can say, I was not conceived in iniquity. And again, my mother did not conceive me in sin. This privilege is contained in those great things done to me by him who is mighty. It was only later in the 15th century, according at least to the reading that I've done, that the uh, Orthodox churches started to say that Mary um, was purified at the Annunciation. And when they tried to spread this teaching to the Slavic churches, the Slavic churches questioned this teaching as novel. So it shows that in the Slavic Christian world, we have always accepted the truth that we celebrate today. People do ask me, and I heard it debated in seminary, does the Byzantine Catholic Church accept the Immaculate Conception? Well, of course we do. And if you think we don't, that to my mind raises serious questions about how you understand our identity as Eastern Rite Christians in communion with the See of Rome. Um, and so the kind of objections that are raised to Mary's Immaculate Conception is say, well, does it put her on a, on a level that's above that of a human being? Does it somehow make her more than human? And of course it doesn't. Does it in some way deprive her of free will to choose sin if she had wished to do so? Of course it does not. Um, that it doesn't detract from her choice never to commit sin, as we believe. So I think that one way we can perhaps understand and explain what Immaculate Conception means is to look at baptism. Now, I don't know if any of you remember the old Baltimore Catechism, but that very succinctly enumerates for us the uh, effects of baptism as follows. Baptism is a sacrament which cleanses us from an original sin makes us Christians, children of God, and heirs of heaven. And you can find the same thing in more elaborated on in the, in the Catechism, paragraph 1263. Baptism cleanses us from original sin. So in other words, I think that all we are really saying is in this feast, we are saying that it is as if the mother of God was baptised from the first moment of her existence. And when you think about it in those terms, perhaps it's not quite so controversial. That just as baptism cleanses us from original sin, so she was cleansed from original sin from the first moment of her existence. But for me, ultimately, the truth of the Immaculate Conception can be found in Lourdes, where the Blessed Mother, only four years after the Pope defined the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, only four years later, in 1858, the Blessed Mother appeared to St. Bernadette Subaru, a young, uh, a young teenage girl. And she said to her, I am the Immaculate Conception. When Bernadette asked her identity, that is how she replied in her local dialect. Que soy era Immaculada Concepción. I am the Immaculate Conception. Bernadette had no idea what that meant but told the parish priest, and the parish priest knew very well what that meant. And that was the beginning of the official recognition of the apparitions at Lourdes. When I went to Lourdes one time, I picked up this uh, magazine, which has information on, as it was at the time, 66 miraculous healings which have demonstrated the truth of the apparitions of our Blessed Mother at Lourdes. Since this was printed, there have been an additional four because now we are up to 70 approved, recognised miracles that have taken place through the intercession of Our Lady of Lourdes, the Immaculate Conception. And this, to me, is where the truth of the Immaculate Conception can be most clearly seen because you can't have one without the other. It doesn't make sense to have miracles at Lourdes 
if the Blessed Mother of God is not, as Lourdes proclaims, the Immaculate Conception. So, may our Blessed Immaculately Conceived Mother pray for all of us that as we too do the will of God, as we too choose not to sin, as she chose not to sin, as we do whatever Jesus tells us to do, that we too are his mother and brothers and sisters and children. Glory to Jesus Christ.